And now it's my honor to welcome back to the stage the director, Hajish Gurkha. Thanks so much. Here, have a seat. So there's one more seat. So if Megan can come up, the associate producer of the film, who used to be anonymous, but she should not be anymore. <laughs> so Megan, I don't know where she is. And was also not aware that we were going to ask her to come up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the title of the film, Beats of the Antinov. Um, <coughs> well, you know what the Antinov is. It's a Russian uh, cargo plane. The amazing thing about the Antonov is just a cargo plane. It wasn't made to bomb people. So what they do is they create these bombs, and they're like normally barrel bombs. They put a lot of uh, whatever they find, needles, metal pieces, whatever in it with TNT. And you can fly, and then, you know, they open it. It's a cargo plane. And then you throw this thing. So you can imagine the amount of accuracy that has. It does no accuracy whatsoever. So you're throwing this thing from very high. And it's really high because the rebels can't touch it. They cannot bomb it, they cannot touch it, so it just flies around and then drop these bombs. And then these bombs just fall and then just go wherever they go. Of course, normally soldiers, they can deal with that. It's really far, I see it, it's coming down, I'm just gonna go away. What happens is a lot of times civilians, kids, cattle, whatever, they're the ones who can't, who don't know how to deal with it, who end up being targeted and killed by these things. So th most of the Antonov bombings and stuff happens because of that. I called it Beats of the Antinov because it's the beat of the Antinov, which is the beat of death, but also the beat because it's music and the beat because I feel that the resilience of the people and the music and all that is very strong and there's so much hope that you would not expect other people to have. So living there and whatnot, there was a lot of hope. So I just had the play on the word of beats and of death and beats of celebration of life. Because I just came back from Luba Mountains about two weeks ago, and there was one day that we had two rounds of bombings came through, and we screened the film at night, and it was uh, very cathartic for the people who were watching it to have that after being bombed for two rounds the, the day. So it was very good, and we had for about a year or so for the editing process, we were showing it and showing it, and a lot of the things in the final cut are from the comments from the people there. So they have everything to do with what you see on the screen. Yeah, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the this identity question and how sort of making the film, um, so many questions came up about not only Sudanese identity, but your own identity and your relationship to the film, et cetera. Yeah, um, so in 2011, that's when Sudan separated. And you stopped having one Sudan, you have two Sudans, and Sudan became um, a third of Sudan left. And with that third, a whole part of people I associate with being Sudanese left. And I started thinking a lot about who am I if I identify as Sudanese, and a third of the country just disappeared. What, what does that make me, who am I? And, and that question was in my mind a lot during that time. So when I made the film, I was that question was very present in my head. Um, and, and that's why it was present in the film. And the whole idea is like, to me, that was the core reason why this war never ends. There's a lot of reasons why war starts, but then why we're continuously in states of war was always the, the identity crisis, that's the Sudanese identity crisis that I had and everybody who's Sudanese had. Uh, was the core reason why that never ended. So, so that was a big deal for me. Mm. Um, <coughs> thank you. How, how was that transformed? Um, well, well the there's a lot of ways I was transformed. The biggest is um, just living with my people from the Nuba Mountains. I'm originally not from the Nuba Mountains. And it's weird because I was just saying I'm from another small tribe in Sudan. And I, or ethnic group, and I was always grew up thinking of myself as that before being Sudanese. And I don't think until I went to the Nuba Mountains and I lived there that I started thinking of myself as Sudanese. And that connection with the Nuba Mountains, which, which I'm Nubian and they're from the Nuba Mountains, so there's historically there's that connection. And the connection only got destroyed because if you start our history from the Arabic Islamic history, then we don't have a connection because our connection is older than that. 
So just when I started doing that and living there and how I got accepted, more than accepted, I just became part of the community, uh, that I started thinking of myself as Sudanese and, and that yes, we can create something that's called Sudanese and it includes all of us. So my struggle has always ha started becoming how, what I was saying, how when I say the word Sudanese, I think in my head all these different groups and I don't think of my head Khartoum. <laughs> Because right now when you say Sudanese, everybody thinks Khartoum. And I think we need, that's the problem of Sudan is Khartoum. So once we forget about Khartoum and we start thinking about everybody else, we start thinking of, which we call the marginalized areas. And I feel like we need to marginalize Khartoum and have the marginalized areas becoming what Sudan is, which it is. Like really Sudan is the rest of this huge country. And I feel like that, that was the change that cha changed a lot in me. And it was this, and I went through this struggle, I'm still going through it, of finding a real Sudanese identity, which I think uh, we might not see in our lifetime. But I think once this government goes uh, and we start to have some freedoms and you started having uh, stuff like girls music. Let's talk about music a bit. Girls music, uh, which is this music that started, yeah, in Khartoum or whatever, but then people decided to just play it everywhere and enjoy it and have their own lyrics to it and own it, and it became Sudanese. So it became what Sudanese identity is. So I feel like once we have that freedom, that whatever Sudanese identity is gonna be, is gonna be stuff that, that, that like, like girls' music, is stuff that is fun, it's what people wanna do, it's what they enjoy, it's what they, create and and move forward and that becomes our culture but right now when the culture is enforced on us um you you have a fake like the, the sudanese culture right now this whole top jalabia thing that they got us interested in is all fake it's not even it's not really our culture it's it's all because now we have to identify because through religion and through language and through all these things that are not us so I feel like that was the biggest change in me, the whole looking at uh, my identity. And it's weird because in a sense, I started feeling more human actually. And it's the first time in my head I started connecting more with humans once I had that idea coming about because it went from, okay, okay, I'm Sudanese and then, and then I was like, ah, oh. I started having the whole Pan-African thing. And then quickly I started having this whole human thing of, yeah, Pan-Africa is cool, but there's a lot of Africans who are immigrants who are now in Netherlands, so I actually have claim to the Netherlands. And slowly I started having claim to other folks in the Netherlands and other places I've been to. So I'm like, I'm still struggling with it, but getting more to this being human. So somehow I became human because of this project.